Most bodybuilders don't know this, but in fact, a properly conducted bodybuilding program is essentially a strength training program. What I want you to get out of this part here is that you'll be training workout to workout for strength increases and evaluating your progress in terms of strength increases. Train for strength and evaluate your progress in terms of strength increases. Some trainees who keep a training logbook that tracks their weights and repetitions on a progressive basis Note that they are able to increase their strength on a consistent basis, but don't always witness size increases of the same magnitude. They want to know why. There are a lot of reasons why this is so, which we will explore in this video. To begin, initial strength gains are neural adaptations. Such motor learning takes place at the start of a person's strength training program, as there is a reluctance on the part of the human organism to produce metabolically expensive tissue if a slight neural adjustment can accomplish the desired result. In a study conducted in 1988 by Professor Digby Sale of McMaster University in Canada, the relative roles of neural and muscular adaptation to strength training were examined. According to Sale, quote, in the early phase of training, neural adaptation predominates, close quote. However, after repeated bouts of this, the organism reluctantly will yield to a size increase. So the beginner may well see increases in strength before witnessing an increase in muscle mass. Mike Menser spoke of this phenomenon happening to him throughout his muscle building career. There were periods of months during which I would get stronger on a regular basis and not gain any weight. As a result, I grew enormously frustrated and almost gave up more time than I cared to remember. When I say frustrated, I mean painfully, agonizingly frustrated. It was only years later that Arthur Jones pointed this out, and I saw it was true in so many cases, that for, for most people, strength comes first. I'm emphasizing it to you here today so that you can avoid my frustration. I don't want you calling me back in two months, in other words, reporting gleefully how much your strength went up. Geez, Mike, I went up. 80 pounds on my squats, 120 pounds on my shrugs, but I only gained 3 pounds. That wouldn't be bad. If you were to gain 3 pounds every 2 months, of course, by the end of the year, you'd end up having gained 18 pounds, which ain't bad. <laughs> Some people wonder just how much muscle that is. Take a moment and visualize sitting in front of you on your dinner table a single individual 1-pound beefsteak. Now imagine 18 of them. That would probably be enough to cover your dinner table almost. If you were to sustain that rate of growth for two years, of course you'd end up gaining 36 pounds of muscle. Imagine 36 individual one-pound beefsteaks at your dinner table. I'm pointing all this out to you today to help you gain a rational perspective on what you can reasonably hope to achieve with this and thus avoid frustration. Frustration is often the greatest hindrance to bodybuilding progress. And of course, part of the reason for frustration is ignorance. There is a proper rational perspective within which to view this. You're not going to gain five pounds of muscle a week, in other words. There may be those weeks, in fact, when you do gain five pounds, which is the way I gained. I would go for several months without gaining any weight, then all of a sudden, voila, I stepped on the scale and I'm five pounds heavier. So, growing stronger is the path to muscle mass increases. Indeed, in order for a muscle to grow stronger after the neural learning process takes place, it must get bigger. And in order for it to get bigger, it must get stronger. Were it otherwise, you would routinely see a person with 12-inch arms bench pressing 450 pounds. Not likely. The strength of a muscle fiber, like the strength of a steel cable, is proportional to its cross-sectional area. In basic terms, if a given muscle is to be twice as strong, it has to have twice the cross-sectional area. But to understand exactly what that means in terms of muscle measurements, you need to do a little work with geometry. I know some bodybuilders hate this mathematical stuff, but it's the key to learning the truth about what's going on with your training and inside your muscles. Suppose you have a muscle in your body that is 3 inches in diameter. The top circle in the figure represents a muscle of that size. This muscle has a cross-sectional area of 7.07 .07 square inches, according to the formula for area of a circle. 
Suppose that you train hard in the gym for a period of time and increase your strength by a very respectable 50%. Let's say you go from benching 240 pounds for 10 reps to benching 360 pounds for 10 reps. Pretty good progress for a seasoned lifter. For the associated muscle to increase its strength by that 50%, it must increase its cross-sectional area by 50%. So, its new area is 1.5 times 7.07 .07, or 10.61 square inches. The bottom circle in the figure represents a muscle with the area of 10.61 inches. But when you measure it, the increase in size will seem to be less. Why? Because people don't usually measure the area, they measure the circumference, or distance around. As you can see from the figure, the circumference increases much less than the area. So your muscle strength will always increase faster than the circumference of your muscle. It's a law of geometry. Furthermore, a muscle is actually made up of millions of individual muscle fibers bundled together. If your muscles contain surplus intramuscular fat, fat contained in the muscle itself. It could be burned off as a result of being in a slight calorie deficit, your exercise, or a combination thereof. If so, the muscle fibers could expand into the area previously occupied by the fat. The result would be a zero change in muscle size. In fact, you could lose the more plentiful subcutaneous fat that most of us have too much of, and the muscle would expand itself into that area. Lose an inch of fat off your arms at the same time you pack on an inch of tricep size and you net out at a zero increase in arm size on the tape measure. Also, your arm or leg or whatever is not 100% muscle. Bone, fat, ligaments, tendons, blood vessels, skin and other components all take up space. These components don't grow with exercise. So even though your muscle increased its area 50% through training, you'll see less change in the size of an entire leg that contains all the other stuff. If that's not enough, 72% of a muscle is water. So if you are a little dehydrated when you take your measurements, you also won't see all the increase you could. These factors together conspire to make size gains a lot harder to achieve than strength gains. But that doesn't change the fact that to get one, you need the other. Just be glad strength gains are so easy to measure with meaningful precision. That's what will keep you on the road of steady progress. Moreover, a variety of factors affect muscle strength and size. The type and density of muscle fibers, the location of tendon insertions, and the length of muscle bellies are inherited characteristics that cannot be altered through training. Consequently, some people possess a greater genetic potential for developing muscle size and strength. Some trainees head for the gym with the idea that getting a good pump is the key to muscle growth stimulation. Unfortunately, there exists no evidence whatsoever that a pump is an index of muscle growth stimulation. All bodybuilders achieve a pump to some degree every time they work out, yet, obviously, not all bodybuilders grow as a result of each workout. For that matter, people who perform high-volume exercise, such as cyclists and joggers, also experience a pump but don't experience growth as a result. If the pump was the be-all and end-all of muscle growth stimulation, then all of the aforementioned athletes would be jumping up in weight classes on an almost weekly basis. A pump is simply edema, or the temporary swelling of tissue, due to a buildup of fluid, in this case blood, in the muscle being worked. Unless growth was stimulated as a result of a workout, however, the muscle will revert to its previous size once the pump subsides. Strength training, which is what proper bodybuilding training really is, doesn't always produce much in the way of a pump. Still, there can be no mistaking the fact that after a hard, heavy-duty workout, the body is about to undergo some profound physiological changes. Could you imagine a massively muscled bodybuilder like Mike Menzer being able to do a machine incline press with only 100 pounds? No. Mike used the entire stack with additional weight pinned on and he had the muscles to prove it. In other words, Mike was as big as he was because he was as strong as he was. If you want to grow bigger and bigger muscles, you should always train with an eye toward strength improvement, as reflected in the weights you lift and the repetitions you perform. It was discovered a long, long time ago that muscular size and strength are directly related. More precisely, the strength of a muscle is proportional to its cross-sectional area. 
In other words, as Mike often pointed out, If you want to get bigger, in other words, you've got to get stronger. If you want to get bigger, you've got to get stronger. I emphasize that one because there's a reluctance on the part of most bodybuilders to accept that idea. If you want to get bigger, you've got to get stronger. Just the other day in Gold's Gym, a young man was arguing with me about that quite vehemently and at some length. I finally stopped him and asked, what are you supposed to do to get bigger? Get weaker? 